Um, thank you very much. I have the pleasure of introducing the third uh, participant of um, our discussion, Elvira. Um, do come up. And uh, the previous speakers as well. Um, Elvira is a new technology lawyer with uh, what I would call a fierce interest in privacy, so the conversation should be very interesting. And uh, given that um, Elvira didn't get a chance to present, she will just uh, do a very short introduction of the issues that she considers important in, I wouldn't say contradiction to what the previous two speakers said, but in compl complementing their arguments. So, do you tell us your, your views? Yeah, try it. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> it had to happen Saturday morning. Um, it's very interesting to be here right now and, you know, having seen uh, those two presentations which are quite clear and strong in uh, giving us the feeling that what we're living today is uh, a moment where technology is incredibly revealing us stuff, which is important not just about technology itself, because, you know, it's algorithms that are learning and becoming smarter and smarter by the minutes, uh, but also, you know, about ourselves, our body, the way our organism and um, health is uh, working and can improve. And, of course, uh, one of the main challenges of uh, technology is uh, um, you know, uh, understand how rights that uh, can be relevant um, are challenged by technology itself. And privacy is obviously uh, a very important issue. Um, I must say that it's not a very original thought, you know, the fact that the privacy is uh, uh, challenged by um, technology. And if we think about the Hippocratic Oath, for instance, which was you know, uh, drafted 400 years before Christ, um, we have a provision that is stating that uh, any, any patient is going to give uh, uh, a doctor his data, allow the doctor to come to his house and visit him and take care of his health on the condition that the doctor is not going to reveal information not only about the illness that he's going to find on the, on the patient, but also on the other situation that he could uh, understand, because at the time the doctor would not be in a hospital, uh, but go and visit the, the patient at his house. So there is this trust relationship that is, the, you know, the first requirement that has to happen for people to benefit. Okay, and that's, uh, I would um, rather um, classify as a real need. So. This need to privacy and the trust relationship, uh, we have it. We have, have, uh, we have uh, brought it together in the years uh, that followed the Hippocratic Oath. And even if, uh, you know, doctors that breach this are not forsaken by the gods, <laughs> Apollo and the others, uh, still there are legal consequences. Now, I don't want to, you know, defend the law uh, just for the law's sake, uh, but it's clear that you need to set some boundaries to protect the weak part, which is the individual. And I think the rights uh, need to gov govern in a way or direct us uh, also in our actions. So they constitute uh, a limit and a foundation on all the benefit. They need to guide the way the benefits are, are going to be deployed and uh, concretely applied mm -hmm. in, in real life. So about the revealing part of technology, um, um, I would spend some words about the power of statistics. Because when we talk about data, uh, we talk about ways to interpret them, understand what they're telling us. And uh, yeah, there are methods to you know, put uh, uh, in relationship uh, data that we're okay, collecting, but also you know, understanding. And we're trying to find more and more ways to, to make a sense out of what we have. And um, it's interesting uh, uh, because uh, there's there's data that we can have and we thought the, they're like unharmful, which can have a potential harm. So think about uh, um, the data of uh, people that are now dead. The deceased person normally doesn't have any right. Uh, they're dead. <laughs> okay, so the, the, the relationship with the, the 
uh, a nation, a government, the law us with a deceased person. It's just the respect of the image that they had when they were alive. So, but for sure, they have no right to privacy. It's acknowledged and understood legally, at least in the European framework, that that could be a correlation um, with the date of the deceased people and a still living person. But there is no harmonization on the sector, and basically, all the 28 states of the United uh, of the European Union mm -hmm. are left to decide to what kind of uh, protection should be given. And um, it's interesting to think that uh, uh, what can uh, the date of a deceased person can uh, can tell us about a living person? Uh, for instance, hemophilia, which is uh, a genetically transmitted mm -hmm. illness uh, with the X chromosome. So if I know that a woman died of hemophilia, uh, then I know automatically that her son has the same illness. But again, uh, also facts that uh, are more related to events, uh, like uh, uh, people died of alcoholism or uh, suicide or violent situation which can have a potential triggers of uh, um, heavy uh, psychological stress and traumatic situation to the offspring and the rest of the family. And the stuff that needs to be really handled with a lot of care because uh, would you hire a person as a pilot of a plane if you know he was taking medication? And I'm not saying this just as an example because, you know, when this information is in the open, it's leaked somehow, even if you could legally not obtain it, then, you know, what has been seen cannot be unseen. And there have been uh, cases where people have been fired or uh, denied the possibility to be hired uh, just because they were treated for depression. So under medication, something that was under control. But, you know, of course, the company for incident staff would not take the risk to uh, to hire such a, a person with this situation, which is something that, of course, you know, we find it totally unjust. And uh, what can we do then? Because uh, uh, it would be totally absurd to refuse uh, all the, the progress and the benefits that technology could give us. What can we do uh, to find the balance? And um, for sure, uh, we need to understand what uh, uh, methodologies so we're using because uh, uh, it's not only uh, the outcome of the data correlation that is very relevant but also the technology that we're using so far and there are some studies that I've <laughs> put on paper um, which show that, um, that anonymity is basically a myth and uh, for instance uh, had a very important study from the my, uh, MIT and the Leuven University has uh, find out uh, um, a new concept of unicity. So basically, if you, we think about the fact that uh, to uh, identify a unique fingerprint, we need just 12 points that matching, and this makes uh, uh, the fingerprint identifiable. Um, data about the mobility, so the places that we, where we go when we use public transit or any kind of transit can reveal our identity. The study basically demonstrates and shows that they just need the four uh, points for data which can relate space or time and uh, with using those uh, three elements they were able to understand, identify uniquely uh, 95 percent of 1.1.5 million people. So that's quite scary and also quite unexpected. No, nobody would ever think that mobility data can have this I I intense uh, trigger and potential. It has been done something similar um, in another event where Netflix, maybe you know that, uh, not in Italy because it's not uh, a, diff uh, a service that is popular yet, but. It's a service where you can rent movies. And of course, you have an account, you have a credit card, so there's something, uh, several data about you, uh, your movie preference and uh, whatever you're seeing can tell something about you. So they wanted to improve uh, the collaborative filtering. So uh, a kind of technique that uh, it's helping you choose movies, which is very frustrating when you have <laughs> such an availability. And uh, basically, it works by recommending other movies relating, that are related in a way or another to the movie that you already chose.
So in this prize, uh, they released uh, a data set which was just set for an, for an example. And uh, they stripped away all the possible data they could. They uh, scrambled the identifiers. And they released this data in public and they set a prize. And um, it was found out that uh, this data set, even if it had a lot of added noise, was still matchable with other data that were on the internet, and uh, in mm. particular, the image movie database. So it was possible to identify the users. So the problem of, of, uh, of um, data, analyzing of data, and uh, aggregated data is always the odd one out. Yeah. Because you can never know when this odd one out is going to you know, spike and uh, yeah. appear in the analysis. This is very scary, actually. <laughs> um, let, me, let me try to um, establish some, some points of the debate. I think we can all agree that data is not neutral. I suppose I'm starting at a low bar here. <laughs> I think we can agree that um, data is not going to be stopped. It's not going to be stopped being gathered and collected and, and appearing, whether as you know, directly collected or as metadata. And we have seen um, the benefits of data for individuals, if they can control it, which was um, Anne's very powerful uh, case. We had, did see another powerful case where uh, data does uh, benefit the individual, in, even in aggregate, in a very different way. And we just had a very scary um, tour of what can go wrong if that data is not handled properly, as you put it, with love and care, which is not necessarily how aggregate or big data people think about data. So um, I suppose that the, the question is, where is the line in, in terms of um, benefits of the individual data to the individual, benefits of the aggregate data to the public interest, and hopefully to the individual where is the line in the smart trade-off, given that we are talking about smart um, in this conference, is there a smart trade-off between um, individual data being part of an aggregate pool and being used for public interest at the cost of privacy of that to that individual? Um, maybe it's the wrong question, but that's what we are asking today. And uh, Roger tried to address that at the end, you know, new body. And this is, you know, I could start talking about what I think about it. However, I think that the speakers have um, um, far more specific and practical approaches to it than I might have. So, um, is there, do you feel comfortable talking about where the line could be or should be? And um, if you think there is a line at all where, you know, aggregate data, should just emerge or what? So my, my take on it is that uh, I care very deeply that an individual be able to get access to their own data, um, you know, with proper timestamps, proper flows, and be able to say, you know, I want to take this and I want to flow it over to here because I see value in, in, in doing that to, to me. And that um, there should be restrictions on other people sort of leeching off that data without that level of permission. Um, and, you know, I don't know what the right mechanism is to allow people to, um, you know, have the, the, the benefits that, that Roger's talking about. Um, but if that comes um, at, at the expense of somebody being able to take the data and use it for their own purposes in, in their, and flow it to their own ways, I, I think that would be a tragedy from my point of view. I completely agree with that, and and I think that um, and it, it, you know so it's it's a remarkable fact about the way that these these data assets have been used that it really is very low on people's list of things to do to actually make these data available to the people about whom the data is you know is, is referring to. The the um, I, I think to to one of the other issues here is that to get the most out of these data for the individual is very hard. And it's an exercise that is not going to be solved by um, a government program to go and find the right solution for making this data useful to the mm -hmm. individual. But a lot of money is spent on exactly that kind of program. This does require innovation, and it requires creative thinking, 
And we have to create a world in which it is possible for organizations to think about how they can use data creatively mm -hmm. for the benefit of the individual. And, and I, I think one of the crucial things is to, to, for that to be possible is that these data cannot just reside within government or with, within healthcare or education systems. There has to be a mechanism whereby they can be uh, uh, external agencies who can work on behalf of, 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 of the public can access them. But we have not yet designed no. the appropriate mechanism for doing this. And, and that's... It's, yeah. Yeah. The question um, for what... I mean, I know you agree with Anne's point about uh, individuals should have access to data directly. Um, it, but isn't it the case that organizations often say, well, people don't either care about their data or they don't know what to do with it or it would cause all sorts of issues? So, you know, it, tell it, us about that. Yeah, I mean, we, we, in, in, in the United Kingdom, what's tended to happen is people have said, oh, we think it's very important that people should be able to access their record. And typically what that means is that you can... You know, in the extreme, you go to a, the, the, the clinic or the, or the GP practice, as we, uh, you can, on a computer screen, you can call up your information and you can read it. And not surprisingly, roughly uh, somewhere less than 1% of people find this an extremely engaging and useful process. To be fair, everybody thinks it's a good idea. Nobody goes, oh, this is terrible. Everyone goes, like, oh, that's actually, thank you. That is quite helpful. But it is just not a very engaging way of, of interacting with your data. And so, and it's, it's also worth saying that what a lot of the opposition, there's, there's, it's worth being really clear that opposition to use of these data comes from two different angles. There is an entirely legitimate concern about privacy and misuse. And there is a, a less legitimate concern from interests who just don't want people to be able to access this data and use it because it means a transfer of power away from them. Yeah. Elvira, do you think access to your own data is sufficient guard or safe safety check against use of that data for aggregate purposes, or where would your position be on that one? Well, access to your own data is fundamental because then you can understand what data is being used. So, and you can check because maybe you keep track of what you were given to doctors or other databases which can be social network or whatever we can imagine and that maybe we're not yet using. Um, but that's not enough because one of the biggest problems of uh, the legislation, the, the privacy protection, is that it's completely tricky to enforce. Um, we are connected, but uh, internet and digital data is, you know, uh, is not something that has uh, the limitation of a piece of paper. So you can hold it. You can also, you know, design a system within United Kingdom when you say this entity has this responsibility, this other entity has this other responsibility. But then what happens is that, first of all, we have to consider ourselves under a constant threat of assault for um, hacking and stuff like that, which exists and there's, you know, all the interest in this world, not to talk about cyber world, but this is a phenomenon that is there and it's just going to increase because, you know, there can be a lot of reasons that why this is, um, is there. Secondly, um, Every data, even if it's aggregate when it's leaked to the public, can still be unscrambled when there is uh, the possibility of other databases. So commercial uses um, and uh, the, the unreachability, you know, of the other companies that could make this, this, this connection of those data is then uh, pretty, pretty vague. vague. And on this, I want to spend uh, a sentence on the ruling mm -hmm. of the European mm -hmm. Court of Justice, which uh, incredibly and against all odds, uh, um, decided that Google, which has not a relationship with people, would be the responsible entity okay, for to delete uh, from uh, the, the, the queries a name uh, when there is, of course, a reason. And they reserve the right to, to do it or not to do it, but you know, then that's mm -hmm. another thing and it will require more, more investigation and more words on why. But it's, it's interesting that this is a, a judicial way to, to, to solve this kind of problem. So a perpetual accountability that is not tied to a contractual relationship. Okay. You have my data, doesn't matter why you got it, you still will love to delete it. And for instance, we, we can have this uh, kind of technology because when you're using this, uh, the, the data, you should be providing at least an email where you can process any request to removal Obviously. or to right. editing yeah. and whatever. Yeah. So you both, um 
believe or suggest an institutional solution of some kind. One is legislative, one is the new new body of sorts, which is interesting. Uh, and what's your position on aggregate data in flux stream? Is there any, or is it just a, um, a moot point? So in, in flux stream, um, your, all of your data that you've connected in or that you've sent in via the API via your account is in your account. And it's all aggregated with each other in time, but it's all about you. Um, you can decide to share it with specific individuals, and then they can, can go and see it as if, uh, mm -hmm. you know, see the, the data in, in your account as you would see it, though they can't manipulate it. Um, but we do absolutely nothing to, to, to take that data and put it together and extract it for our own purposes. It, the only purpose of it, of it being there is to support whatever your use of it is. And we're passionate about that. And, and a lot of people come up to us and say, oh, but oh, you could do all of these amazing things if only you would aggregate it and, you know, blah, 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 exactly. and anonymize it. And I'm like, sorry, anonymization's myth. And I feel strongly that, that, you know, people aren't going to be stopped from doing what I care about them doing by fear of aggregation. So I just don't do it. This is very unusual, and I speak as somebody who is involved in quantified self as well. Um, from the inside of the movement, we treat in data as individuals. It's for our purposes. If we share it, we share it. But that is the secondary purpose is sharing. It's, it's, it's not about... Um, it, quantified self is not driven by wanting to know how I fit into um, other people, how I compare to other people. Um, there is a point to baseline, there is a point of comparing at some point, but it is not the driving force. People from outside quantified self assume that the, the, the quantity of data gathered is just treasure trove for aggregation and for analysis. And in some ways, of course they're right, aggregate data is beneficial. Um, however, there is a very there is, it's a very difficult point to make because even format-wise, even, even the, the actual um, collection of data, because it's driven by the individual, it is not necessarily possible to aggregate it in the same way when you have a system helping you collect data about yourself and then slotting it into data of other people. So uh, the aggregate data in, and quantified self is, is, is a bit of a tension going on there. And I think Flagstream is unique in the sense that it's not trying to aggregate things and, and not even um, aiming for that at some point. Whereas most of those devices that we saw on the screen um, were actually uh, predicated on a model that, that aggregate data will somehow continue their existence at some point. <laughs> Fitbit in particular presumably um, zero as well. And they had some beneficial findings from that. I mean, do you think, do you think there is a room for, for aggregate data and quantified self at all? I think it's a different type of endeavor. I mean, there, there are plenty of people who want to do that endeavor, but I think that the, that has to really be done for a different purpose under different auspices. Um, quantified self is, is about the individual being able to pursue whatever they want to pursue sort of fluidly and not worry about somebody else's protocol, somebody yeah. else's assumptions about, about data integrity or, or comparability. If you're worried about comparability, you can't do what I'm talking about. Yeah, and that gets us back to, I think, the first um, point I tried to make, that data is not neutral. It seems a very trivial point, but actually it's fundamental because it means that um, if you, that there are value judgments embedded, the way you interpret it, the way you uh, gather it, all the parameters that you gather, and also um, the, the contextual data that only the individual knows that will determine how um, you can, can fundamentally change the analysis. Uh, uh, just uh, just to, to, to comment on, on that, which I, th I mean, I, broadly, I believe exactly what you've said, and I think you're right. I have a complete in view of where we are with aggregate data in general. I think you're making exactly the right move by saying, I'm not going to get anywhere into that because we got, we got some stuff to do to, 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 to sort that out. But uh, just a, a small counterpoint, which is, I mean, if, we, if you go to your slide deck, when you have the, um, the SNPedia uh, stuff, that is a use of aggregate data that gives you a sense of how rare that particular situation is, which is useful to you. Right. And I think as, as, a, as an input into the thinking, knowing what, you know, some of the outputs from aggregate data can be useful as a starting point for people in, 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 in self-tracking, thinking what, what, what avenues they might be interested in, in, in pursuing or just understanding exactly that sort of point. 
Yeah, and I didn't mean to say that that type of endeavor is valueless. What I meant to say is that that type of endeavor is a different type of endeavor than Fluxstream supports. Yes, that, that indeed. And in this note, I'm going to open um, the discussion to the questions because we've, we've sort of, we could do this for a long time. So, uh, any questions about, yep. Yeah. I, th I think two points that need to be attention here. One is the behavioral consequence of statistics. I mean, I'm, I'm working with one US hospital where they have to import doctors from Canada because US doctors will not perform operations because the measurement of death rate means that their statistics and insurance might actually change. And we're seeing some other consequences that actually roll through. I think the other point is the different level at which statistics work. So I can see how statistics on overall performance start to match against human observation. There's something wrong. I need some evidence to back me up to get people to pay attention. I'm far less sure that they can create any predictive capability. In fact, I'm pretty sure on theoretical grounds they can't, um, as they're currently used from attempts to do the similar sort of area in counterterrorism, where actually it turns out to be practically and theoretically impossible to use statistics to deal with, uh, coming back to your presentation, stuff which is on the outlier of a Pareto distribution, not in the center of a norm. So I think there's a horses for courses issue about understanding the limits of different types of statistics, and there's a behavioral consequence of statistics which needs to be addressed right up front, rather than just jumping onto the, on, on the bandwagon now. Excellent. Anybody, yeah? I, I mean, I, I agree with both of those points. Uh, on, on the first, uh, the... Um, uh, the, 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 the only, uh, I completely agree with you, and you, if you look at, for example, the education um, slides, you can see some of the impact of uh, use of data in particular ways. The, the, the only slight issue I have, I suppose, is that often the fear of um, risk aversion by doctors is held up as a reason not to collect or not to use the data, and I don't think that's a legitimate w response. I mean, we can see, for example, in heart surgery, they were very worried about it, but in fact, the riskiness of patients has in fact increased. And often it is the right answer, and we do see is that, that often the right solution, if you, if, 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 when you look at these data, is to say, actually, do you know what, as a doctor, and I had an example of this very recently, as a doctor, you really should not be operating on these riskier patients. You're not doing enough of this, and you should actually stop. But as long as they are then treated, that's fine. And the, and the data can, 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 can tell us that. Mm -hmm. On the predictive stuff, I, I have to say, I mean, I think, I, I think there is a pretty, there's a, I think theoretically, there are arguments that where it might be possible in some circumstances, but in terms of what, how it has actually worked in terms of risk stratification and the, the ability of that kind of analysis to help health systems be better at treating the individual, it's a pretty poor track record to date. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, many more questions? Yes, Leon. Thank you. Um, two questions. One from Mr. Roger Tate. Uh, legally speaking, are the UK judges taking seriously this data, the one you showed us, and consider it during trials as indisputable proof or evidence? That's the first question. And the second is for Elvira Belangeli. And what's your point about the right to be forgotten when it comes to health information, even if this uh, would somehow um, jeopardize the validity of the big data? So if people ask, erase my records about this specific disease. Thank you. Which one? Okay. <laughs> on, on the first one, uh, the answer is, broadly speaking, no, these data. And I think it's probably true in, in the, the United States as well, in the sense that, and it goes back to, to, to read your point, which is these data are quite good for identifying whether there, there's maybe um, major systemic issues. They aren't really helpful in trying to identify was this individual patient managed correctly. For that, you have to get down to the specifics of, of that case. And do you have anything to add to that? Or you, well, um, it's a very tricky situation because it depends on when you're asking for it. Uh, as you might know, um, when you have to um, perform an healthcare uh, operation or whatever, uh, to a person that is not conscious, even if it is conscious, that's one uh, of the situation where you're not asked to ask for consent. You can just do it. So that's uh, absolutely something to be taken into account. Then again, um, yes, you can have your data deleted from the database. So, uh, that, that's something for sure. You can never uh, have them redacted or uh, encrypted if they aren't, um, updated if they aren't. That's all your rights. 
there is a structural problem, actually, to have access to those data even when you wanted to. Um, a physician uh, that is referred to another specialist will have no access to, to, to the data of the patients unless the patient is not willing fully getting a copy of that and presenting this to his doctor, whether it is a GP or a specialist, this is sadly something that is ingrained in a system that is not properly designed. So in theory, this thing is possible. Uh, you need to understand and first ask yourself if it's feasible. For sure, uh, there is a relationship between physician or hospitals and patients, which forbids uh, basically the commercial usage. That and is research, and then yeah. again on research we have the anonymity problem, but that's, yeah. that's there. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we have uh, one more question. It, it was, um, I, I guess, a thought question around the thing about ownership and commercial use, <clears throat> and the fact that it's our data, <laughs> and just looking at things like um, BitTorrent, uh, not BitTorrent, Bitcoin, <laughs> and, and the way the blockchain distributes information amongst a sort of peer-to-peer -peer network. What are the prospects for us collectively, if you like, having some central place where we all get to see the data rather than having to consign it to some commercial or authoritarian interest, if you like? That would be very, very cool. <laughs> <laughs> but it's kind of, a, yeah, it would be amazing. But it's, it's um, uh, you know, that sort of possible future is, is, is exactly the sorts of things that we need to be to working on now. But, um, yeah. It's actually interesting from an uh, anonymity point of view. Um, Bitcoin isn't anonymous. It, it, it feels like that to a lot of people, but actually isn't. And as technology improves um, and ways of um, some analytical techniques um, become more it's, it's sophisticated. A first, it's a first yeah, step, it, yeah, but it is interesting. So that, that sort of um, brings. I think that one of the main points, because we do not have an answer, we don't know what there is a smart trade of where, where the line is, is awareness, is actually understanding what, in what shape and where, where everywhere your data can exist and it does exist and what is being done to it. It's actually very, fi very difficult to find that out. We don't actually know to what extent our data is being used by um, commercial and other organizations. But at least in, in known interactions with institutions, uh, businesses, web services, platforms, at least in those interactions, we, can, we, we are aware of our data being either um, created by us or created by the other side. And at least understanding that um, the data should belong to us in as much as it belongs to other well, and, sorry, and also taking responsibility because I just, for a while I've suspected that LinkedIn was inviting other people from my Gmail account addresses without my permission and it's just been confirmed today because there's been a legal case taken against them in the yeah. States. So if I hadn't bothered to look through the whole terms and conditions to see that bit that said they have the right to invite people on my behalf into my own network, I don't see it. Yeah. So I think that whole thing, the onus on us, that trade that we make with companies we need to think about. It's totally tricky. Yep. Roger, and, and, and I, I mean, I think there's, there's also, I think it's, it's one of the reasons it's so important to get this right is that um, I think there's a risk that we actually start going, sort of taking a step backward and that we start, people are so worried about what's going on that they start saying they want lots of stuff deleted. And, you know, that, you know the, 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 it has always been the case that, for example, births, deaths and marriages are public information, I think that they should continue to be public information. People might not want people to know who their parents are, but it, part of the way society works, we've agreed actually that is going to be a piece of public information. We're at risk of starting to unwind that stuff and say, no, no, we're going to keep everything secret because we just don't know what's going yeah. on. And, yeah. No, but yeah. it's the format. In that case, you know, imagine Facebook, which is the perfect database query. You know, the sex, you know, the hometown, you know, who is married with whom. So it's all there in a form that's uh, downloadable. Instead, if you want to know who is married to whom, you have to go to the municipality and uh, make a formal request. Maybe you will wait days and you will get it on paper. I mean, come on. <laughs> what, not, not. <laughs> no, no, but it's not about the secrecy. It's about shortening and uh, uh, diminishing the limits. Okay, the, the, the cost of getting information, and this is where you get a balance, because we have law, laws that protect this kind of uh, oh, yeah. relationship. Yeah. Uh, exactly, because, you know, it, it was structurally private. 
but now it isn't. So this is where it's changed. It's one tricky situation where making stuff easy becomes a problem, which is I understand and I, I, I totally feel it. Uh, it. Kind of a contradiction, but yeah, yeah. Whichever wants to respond to that, Any, uh, anything. Res respond to which? No, no, no. Uh, Roger was sort of nodding in a way that suggests that he has something interesting to say. No, no okay. I, I mean, oh, well. I, I, I think, there, yeah, there, you're right, there's, there is an issue about ease, ease of access, although it kind of varies in territories, because some territories, you know, death records are just uh, el electronic. Um, the, uh, but, but uh, it isn't just that. There is, there is this, um, uh, there is this, you know, and I think one of the, one of the important points about this as well is, 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 is the, is, is distinguishing between the data and the use of data. So I thought one example, interesting one, was this question of sort of would, would it be okay to be an airline pilot if you're on a certain medication? Now, the answer to that is not let's keep it secret. I mean, if there is an issue about airline pilots being on medication, I definitely don't think, you know, it's either yes, that is an issue, and in which case it's okay to act on it, or it isn't an issue, in which case it's not okay to act on it. But trying to fix that problem by just simply saying the data shouldn't be, you know, because you, you, know, you obviously apply for a job in an airline pilot, you're going to have to say, Mm -hmm. I agree totally with you. I think that the outcome of this over, uh, overabundance of information is that a lot of stuff will be normalized. But Excellent. we're not the, the, uh, there yet. Okay, that's good. But any more questions? Yep. Oh my goodness, okay. Yeah. Okay, so last question or maybe two? One? Just one. Okay, um, 10 years ago, uh, my first son uh, was born with a, a heart congenic uh, congenital cardiopathy and he has to be treated in, uh, as a newborn on, its, uh, on his uh, 14th day of life. When I uh, discussed about, uh, with the surgeon, uh, I knew the very good mortality, so very low mortality statistics in uh, uh, Bologna hospital. So I told him, okay, I, I'm feeling safe because the mortality is low. And, uh, he, he wisely replied to me, um, statistics are good for doctors. You are, your son is 100% one, uh, of the cases. So you don't have to think about it. And uh, being uh, myself uh, uh, a physicist, uh, I study physics, I'm quite comfortable with statistics and I got the message. And afterwards, uh, the, uh, the procedure uh, went very well, but we had best statistics. We needed, in an unexpected way, a second uh, surgery one month uh, later. Mm. Now my son is alive and well and playing in Trieste. Uh, the problem is, uh, uh, um, my wife and me, uh, both physicists, we were comfortable with that kind of message about statistics versus the individual big numbers versus the single number. Mm. In the, uh, even, uh, my question is, even in the better case scenarios of uh, public data assets with good permission, with everything assessed, uh, there is an education of the public problem in interpretation of the, of the data. So, uh, a hospital with very, very good statistics could be misinterpreted as an hospital with 100% of good statistics. So what do you think? Just a quick um, address to the question. Anybody has something? I, I, I completely agree. But I, but I also think one of the routes to coming to that is the sort of stuff that, that Anne is talking about, which is, and this is why it's so important to give people the Sorry, right. Sorry, I was late uh, this morning. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> My fault. But, but, no, but just if, if, this, if people it's can become time. engaged in understanding what, what information is saying about themselves and about their own healthcare, it's a, it's a good route into people, getting people interested in this stuff. I think there's, there are presentational ways, there's educational ways of, of getting people to understand the sorts of data you're talking about. But really at the root of it is about people feeling empowered enough and, and feeling that they can actually change things for themselves to, to make them want to understand this and to make it worth their while understanding what information means because they can, make, they can really make decisions that will make an enormous difference to their lives. And so I think that's, that's part of the solution anyway. So, yep. Thank you very much. I think that sums it up pretty well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.